Hey everyone, welcome to this three-part series on the Bone Marrow 101. Uh, in this first lecture, we will be talking about an introduction to hematopoiesis and going over the process and the indications for the bone marrow biopsy. As always, you can follow me on social media. All the information is given on the screen. All right, so hematopoiesis is an amazing thing. It starts very early on. As you can see from the top part, there's a, an embryo here. And within the yolk sac lining, you have rudimentary kind of just endothelial cells. And these endothelial cells initially start budding off and they become a cluster of CD34 positive immature types of cells. And they start flowing within the rudimentary vascular system within the fetus. So it's very, very intriguing. This is kind of how it starts off. And if you think about the phases of hematopoiesis, there is a mesoblastic phase, a hepatic phase, and a medullary phase, right? And so initially what we have is that the placenta, the yolk sac, and other fetal organs uh, are putting together the hematopoietic uh, system, effectively churning out the cells of the bone marrow. Uh, this ultimately goes to the fetal liver. There's also some uh, component in the spleen and the thymus. And at birth, the baby uh, is mainly producing bo uh, bone marrow cells from the bone marrow in the bones. All right, so for example, the medullary marrow. Here is uh, the stages, here are the stages of hematopoiesis. One is the mesoblastic phase uh, with the yolk sac being the predominant producer of hematopoietic cells. By the third month or even before the third month, this is kind of over and the liver has taken over uh, hematopoietic production. That's the hepatic phase. And then ultimately the bone marrow, again, as, at the time of birth, the bone marrow is the most active uh, component. If you look at our age in years, as we uh, become older and older after birth, so you can see that the vertebral column uh, maintains the highest amount of cellularity for the marrow. And the other ones, uh, other locations such as the sternum, the rib, the femur, and the tibia, they all kind of decrease over time. The lymph nodes do also produce some hematopoietic cells. Um, however, this kind of stays constant and is a low cellularity uh, throughout our life. The structure of the bone marrow is important. Remember, if you think about uh, canalicular bone, uh, think of the hematopoietic cords, there's sinuses, uh, there's an artery that is obviously providing nutrition and oxygen to the marrow. Uh, and then you have to also consider things like the bone and the endosteum when we're thinking of the marrow biopsy. Uh, there is a concept of yellow marrow that is very uh, heavy in adipocytes, right? That's why it's yellow. Uh, and also has the mesenchymal stem cells that are responsible for producing all of the elements of the marrow. And and uh, the yellow marrow can retrogress into red marrow if, for example, the body requires more red marrow uh, production. This is a nice uh, overview of where the cells are lying. This is a sinus. You can see that uh, this, is the, this is the outside of the sinus. So these are all of the hematopoietic cells. The adipocytes are crucial. The megakaryocytes sit at the edge of the sinus and extend little pieces of the cytoplasm that breaks off and becomes platelets. Uh, you have all other uh, features of the marrow here. And what we'll do is we'll review that as we look at the different types of cells. So it's important to remember, generally, monophyletic hematopoiesis is what we uh, kind of um, agree upon is the way hematopoietic cells are made. Uh, this involves a long-term uh, self-renewing stem cell, which ultimately becomes a shorter-term self-renewing stem cell, and then ultimately a multipotent progenitor hematopoietic stem cell. These divide into a common myeloid and common lymphoid progenitors. And as the name suggests, the common myeloid progenitor will take a part in giving rise to all sorts of myeloid cells. This includes the erythroid cells as well, the red blood cells. And the common lymphoid progenitor gives rise to all of the T cells, the V cells, and other lymphoid uh, associated cells. So it's important to remember that if any there, if there is an abnormality or a malignant transformation in any of these cells, wherever they are, that is the type of phenotype that they will express, right? So for example, it can be, uh, if it's at the level of the common lymphoid progenitor, um, then it's very immature versus if it's at the, you know, so you're thinking lymphoblastic. And if it's kind of at the periphery or like at the mature B cell, you're thinking of mature B cell lymphoma. Otherwise, in plasma cells, obviously, you're thinking of myeloma. There are many cytokines and growth factors that are extremely important in this, um, in this progress. Naturally, if you're thinking of one cell that can give rise to all sorts of cells and the uh, differentiation is key uh, based on what type of factors we give. Uh, these factors are not the basically the important 
feature of what I'm talking about today, uh, but it is important to remember as we review the morphology. So again, these are just uh, some visuals about what will be happening. This is the different phases of the hematopoiesis. Uh, but you can also think of what is actually happening to all of the cell types. You can see that as the baby, if the fetus grows towards birth, the MCV comes down a little bit, the hemoglobin goes up, the platelets around 20 weeks of age become kind of stable and the WBCs go up. Just as the baby is born and comes into this world, naturally outside the uterus, the oxygen tension and the different physiological stretches stresses are very different. And so there's a remarkable change in all sorts of features of the hematopoietic cells. Again, that isn't the focus of our conversation today, but it's important to remember how fetal hematopoiesis is different from um, childhood hematopoiesis and how important and fascinating all of those things are. You can consider though that you know there is a size for the marrow, how big the bone marrow is. And if you think of an adult bone marrow, the red uh, shaded areas in the skeleton are where the marrow is actually uh, produced, right? Mar marrow cells are present. The total marrow space is around four liters, right? So it's between 2,500 and 4,000 uh, 4, uh, milliliters of marrow. But the active red marrow within this is only up to 1,500 grams. If you compare that or contrast it with the child, the total marrow space is only 1600 ml, but the active red marrow can go up to 1400 grams. And so it's interesting to think about this from a volume perspective, that although the volumes are very different, the amount of activity is very, very similar in the marrow between the children and adults. And this slide was very kindly given to me by Dr. Christian Schaffernack, one of the most amazing pediatric pathologists and hematopathologists um, who, uh, who I happened to rotate with after fellowship. Um, he also had added this fantastic line uh, from this book, uh, every day an estimated 2.5 billion red cells, 2.5 billion platelets, and 1 billion granulocytes are produced per kilogram body weight in normal conditions, right? So this is per kilogram body weight. So this is fascinating. You have to think of like, as we're going down this road of hematopoiesis, you have to consider that these are unbelievably productive and hyperproliferative cells, right? Nothing is uh, probably as... Uh, prolific as the marrow is, if you think about it for cells. So let's think about why we, in, uh, you know, what are the indications for bone marrow examination? So the bone marrow is naturally uh, an organ that you can access. It is a little tricky. Uh, simplest thing obviously is the peripheral blood biopsy, which is obviously just a blood smear. Uh, you know, you don't think of it as a biopsy, but it truly is. And, you know, it tells you so much, but let's say that there is a peripheral blood abnormality. And one of the major indications for bone marrow examination is investigation of that peripheral blood abnormality, right? So for example, the marrow is the factory and the peripheral blood is what the factory is producing. So if there's up, up or down, uh, up, ups and downs happening in the peripheral blood, then the factory has to be investigated, right? So that's why you could do a bone marrow. Naturally, bone marrow examinations are important for the primary diagnosis of leukemias, myelodysplastic syndromes, or myeloproliferative neoplasms. Basically, um, any myeloid disorder needs to typically be associated with the bone marrow exam. Sometimes in cases of infectious disease, uh, if the peripheral blood uh, is uninformative and the clinicians or the patient-facing colleagues are a little confused as to what's happening, infectious disease workups can also involve bone marrow examination, uh, as can uh, involve fe fever of unknown origin, where the patients have systemic mast cell disease, metabolic bone disease, or even unexplained splenomegaly. They can be useful in evaluation of a constitutional hematologic disorder, storage disease, or metastatic lesion. Definitely for staging of certain neoplasms like lymphomas, if a patient is diagnosed with a peripheral lymphoma, like a mature lymphoma, then a bone marrow biopsy typically follows to see if the marrow is involved or not. There can always be unexplained radiographic lesions that are uh, kind of um, like um, coming from the marrow uh, or there are marrow signals that are unexplained. And so one can do bone marrow examination for that as well. Naturally, once patients are treated for hematopoietic neoplasms, then the follow-ups involve routine evaluation of the marrow uh, on a certain kind of time frame. Preautologous stem cell transplantation, one always performs the marrow just to see what the state of the marrow is before the stem cell transplant is performed. On the left here is a Jamshedi needle. It's a needle with, a, uh, like with, a, with an empty kind of bore and like a needle inside it. And this is what is used to uh, perform the bone marrow procedure. 
On the right, you can see in A, here is a patient who is prone. There is a clean field and um, one of our hematologist oncologists is about to perform the procedure. First is the installation of the anesthetic to the skin and kind of the deeper area. After that, uh, there, you know, people can do it different ways. Here, this is the doctor is holding the top part of the Jamshidi needle here, and what they're doing is they're rotating it back and forth, back and forth, and like kind of coring into the bone. Uh, once that is done, one of the parts of the biopsy takes out an actual piece of bone. This is the bone core biopsy. And then after that, another syringe is attached here. And then they aspirate blood from this, which includes marrow elements, and then they smear it. So ultimately what happens is that we're going into the posterior iliac crest. You are going into the bone and taking out two types of specimens. One is an aspirated material, which is blood and marrow fragments, which you can just smear. The other one is an actual bone core biopsy, which will have the whole architecture intact with the bone with it. So what happens uh, afterwards, right? So after you do this procedure, uh, the fresh material uh, is, uh, is ideal for molecular studies. So this, the aspirate smear can actually go directly for molecular studies. Uh, flow is also done on living cells that are not fixed. And so that material can also go for flow cytometry analysis for phenotyping of the cells. And the aspirate smears, like I was mentioning to you, are made from this, right? So the aspirate smear as shown here, gives you, uh, you know, a little flecks of bone, but basically uh, they don't come in the way and you can see beautiful nuclear morphology, uh, cytoplasmic quality, and really, you know, whoever thinks that a heme path isn't partly cytopath, they're wrong. It's actually all cytopathology. This is a right Gimsa stain. It's a modification. It's a modified Romanovsky stain. Uh, it's one of my favorite stains. So I always like to show James Homer Wright and uh, Dmitry Romanovsky here because these are the gentlemen who kind of... Um, not only came up with the stain, but then the, the uh, Homer, James Homer Wright actually modified the Romanovsky stain a little bit as well. So this is a beautiful stain. You can make out nuclear chromatin patterns. You can see what is condensed chromatin, what is open chromatin. You can see things like nucleoli, beautiful things like granules. And so hematopoietic activity can be uh, looked at. In contrast, the bone core biopsy obviously has a piece of bone in it. So after it's fixed properly, it then needs to be decalcified for a certain amount of time. And then after that, it goes through the regular routine processing, which is typically formal and fixed, you know, paraffin embedded tissue. And so this requires a little bit more time. So, you know, you're, you have two types of specimens, a bone marrow core biopsy and a marrow aspirate smear, but, but both, both of them don't come out at the same time. Aspirate smear can be stained the same day. Typically the core biopsy comes out the next day. This is what happens with the core biopsy. This is not actually core biopsy that they're cutting. That would be too thick, but I'm just trying to show you that this is the formalin uh, fixed paraffin embedded tissue that is on a microtome. Very thin, four to five micron sections will be cut. After that, they'll be stained and cover slipped, and then the core biopsy will look like this, right? With pieces of bone in it, and it'll actually be cut out, and there's adipocytes uh, here and there, and you can see the marrow cells in between. So the reason we look at both these specimens is because the aspirate is fast and it gives you a relative quantity of the different cell types, right? You can count these actual cells. So per the WHO classification, we count 500 marrow cells and give a differential. And it provides the material that I was mentioning for flow and molecular studies. The problem though is that it does not always represent all cells. Think of situations where, for example, there are uh, there's fibrosis in the marrow or for example, there is a lesion that is very very tight, meaning that it is holding on to itself and it's not aspirable. Then in that case, what will happen is that the marrow will either be empty or it will look normal and it won't represent all the cells that are present. So that's why we always complement the aspirate with a biopsy procedure. And the biopsy procedure, you again have an ability to analyze cells and stroma here, as opposed to there was no stroma usually uh, in the aspirate. It represents all cells. So for example, if in this area that I'm trying to point out, there was a clump of plasma cells that didn't come out and the aspirate, you would still see them when you cut through the bone. Or if there was a tremendous amount of fibrosis and the aspirate was empty, you would be able to tell that, well, the aspirate was empty or it was a dry tap because of all of the fibrosis. But the problem with this one, the drawback obviously is that it's slower. So it takes a day to come out and then you can perform IHC stains on top of this as well.
So when you think of uh, hematopoietic evaluation, you are looking at not only the history of the patient, the laboratory data that we are presented with, it's very important to start with a peripheral blood smear and see what the abnormalities are uh, in the peripheral circulation. Uh, this is a very nice triple uh, smeared bone marrow aspirate smear. So you need to work with an aspirate smear and also a bone marrow core biopsy. And most institutions also do iron stains and reticulin stains as well. So the differential count of the marrow is a little bit obviously different from the differential count of the peripheral blood. You have to account for all of the immature uh, granulocytic cells, uh, which we will be talking about in uh, up upcoming videos, the erythroid cells and also the other cell types, right? And typically a normal myeloid to erythroid ratio is three to one. I'd like to pause here for one second and talk about the myeloid to erythroid ratio. So, you know, as you remember from a few slides ago, the hematopoietic system was divided into myeloid and erythroid. And here we're giving a myeloid to erythroid ratio, but erythroid is also a myeloid cell, right? So this can confuse people. Basically what this ratio is, is a granular site to an erythroid ratio. Both of these cell types are myeloid. However, we're giving a ratio of the grans to the erythroid cells. So don't get confused why, we, you know, it's just an ME ratio. That's what we call it. You know, it's not a myeloid to lymphoid ratio. It's a granulocytic cell to erythroid cell ratio. And typically then, granulocytic cells are three times more than uh, erythroid cells are. Another thing that we take for granted usually is the cellularity is 100 minus the patient's age. So for example, if I am 40 years old, then a normal marrow for me would be 100 minus 40, which would be 60% cellular. This works really well for people who are in the, you know, kind of in middle age, right? In the, you know, between the 20s and the 20 is in middle age, but you know, 20 to 50, 60, because you don't imagine that a person who is 99 years old will have a 1% cellular marrow. And you don't really expect that a one year old will have a 99% cellular marrow, right? So, uh, you know, this is, this is not always correct. However, you can use it for purposes of just simplicity. There were studies done actually back in the day, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have the correct reference for this, but it's an old study, very old study, I believe from the United Kingdom, where um, normal volunteers basically gave their marrow and their ages. And so you can see that, you know, even when the age is very little, so for example, between one and 10, the, the range of the of a normal marrow is like just under 100 to actually all the way down to like 40, right? Like, so here it's, I agree that these ones, like 40% cellular marrow, wouldn't be considered a normal cellular marrow for a 10-year-old. However, a 10-year-old can have a 70% cellular marrow, and that would be completely normal, right? And so the 100 minus age thing doesn't necessarily work for extremes of age, right? So here, uh, it would be inaccurate. And here, if you take a look at an 80-year-old, you can see that at 75, the average uh, you know, marrow is like just under 40%. So that doesn't necessarily make that much sense with the 100 minus age either. So keep that in mind. The cellularity is basically your hematopoietic cells, which are the pink cells here, uh, in contrast with the uh, adipocytes, which are optically clear and typically spherical, right? So when they're processed, they're just empty spaces. So this would be a hypocellular marrow, this would be a more hypercellular marrow, and this would be an even more hypercellular marrow. This is just to contrast, right? So the one on the left here would be completely normal in a, in a baby, but it would be very abnormal in an 80-year-old. And most of us probably listening to this talk will have a marrow that's approximately like this on the right. So now that you know how the marrow kind of is developing, we have to remember that the hematopoietic stem cell is not necessarily morphologically identifiable. Uh, this undergoes lineage commitment and becomes a progenitor cell, uh, and that also is morphologically unrecognizable. And then after the lineage commitment comes differentiation commitment, and then what you are left with is a blast. A blast is the first recognizable cell that we can uh, kind of look at, and then ultimately it matures out and can make any type of cell here it's making, uh, probably a neutrophil. These are arranged in the marrow such that you have the bone. So you have to think of the bony cells like the osteoclasts and the osteocytes within the bony spicule. Right next to the bone typically are the granulocytic precursors. The most immature ones are lining right up next to the bone. Uh, you have the blasts and then the promyelocytes, metamyelocytes eventually become neutrophils. You have the sinusoidal lumen. This is the sinusoidal lining and the megakaryocyte sitting right next to it. And then you also have clusters of erythroid cells, which are known as erythroid islands. So this is basically what we just 
just described here, and we're going to build this marrow together. We're going to go through all of the different cell types in the subsequent videos. Here you have the pink bone, right next to it is the granulocytic cell. Uh, the sinuses are open and the platelets are being shed off from megakaryocytes. And then obviously there are erythroblastic islands there as well. And in the next video, we will be talking about erythropoiesis. Um, don't forget to like this video and to subscribe to the channel and to also subscribe to any of the social media outlets below on the right side that you are interested in. I'll see you next time.